1 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. It's the first Friday of the month. And after a gap of one month, the Education Committee of the ISPN is back with the Clash of the Titans. And what titans we have today. A great topic, a controversial subject. Two people who have done a lot of work on the subject and a moderator whose name is almost synonymous with research into hydrocephalus. It gives me great pleasure to introduce today the moderator for this morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are on this planet, a man who decided at 12 years of age that he wanted to be a physician, who decided in his first clinical rotation in medical school that he wanted to be a pediatrician, and whose first neurosurgical operation, if I remember by his own admission, lasted for 14 hours till 3 a.m. in the morning and convinced him that that was the right subject to pursue. I would like to introduce to you Professor Harold Rickett, who is currently the director of the Chiari Institute in New York and has spent 26 years of his life before at the Barrow Neurological Institute. Professor Rickett has done more work in hydrocephalus than any living creature on the surface of this planet. And it is fitting that he should moderate this session for us. Of course, he is no stranger to the ISPN. In the United States, he's been the president of every organization. I think save being president of the United States, he's been president of almost everything else. Thank God for that though. And he's been president of the ISPN in 1999. He has well over 200 articles in peer-reviewed journals, has contributed more than 100 book chapters. And if I were to tell you his academic profile, I would spend the better part of this evening. So without much ado, Hal, all yours. Welcome to this debate. Thank you so much, uh, Sandeep. It's hard for me to uh, follow, uh, follow that. You, you've found things about me. I, I don't even want to know some of the things you've probably found, <laughs> found out about me, but I'm happy uh, to be here. I think this is an extraordinarily interesting, controversial and evolving uh, problem uh, or area of research. Um, we will be discussing uh, yes or no for prenatal surgery for hydrocephalus. Uh, a very complicated um, uh, problem to deal with. Uh, we will, Dr. Um, Sonoduru is now in Cincinnati in the great prenatal surgery section at the University of um, Cincinnati and Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And an old friend who spent some time um, with me and uh, we also have seen each other in Turkey um, and for the no, will be Taka Inagaki from Im, uh, um, Imbraki Children's uh, Hospital. And he's the vice president there and very um, respected pediatric neurosurgeon. So we'll begin with uh, Professor Duru uh, with the uh, pro uh, discussion. Uh, Sonar, it's all up to you at the moment. For everyone I would that is not speaking, I suggest that you mute your um, your your side, uh, so we don't get a lot of um, background noise, uh, and uh, we can un unmute it for the questions and answers, etc. So I'm going to mute mine, and we'll give the floor to Professor Duro. Thank you. Sonar, you did? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the, uh, I want to thank uh, the education, ISPN Education Committee and the Sandeep and Riket. Thank you for this, the, 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 uh, talking to, a bit about the issue, this opportunity. Yes, this is very challenging, the situation, uh, this, um, the, we know of the fetal obstructive hydrocephalus generates the progressive irreversible fetal brain damage. 
by ventricular enlargement, incremental mechanical compression, denudation, and finally, chaotic secondary changes. We know the, we can diagnose the, the, during the second, second trimester uh, the fetal hydrocephalus. Uh, we can say if the, before 30 weeks of gestation, we can say early hydrocephalus, especially our target, our studies target early hydrocephalus, early isolated hydrocephalus. Uh, the, we can say the late hydrocephalus after the 30 weeks of gestation. So uh, we know the ventricle measurement, uh, if the normal atrial plane uh, is the lateral ventricle uh, width, the, if the, the, uh, the last is 10 millimeters, the normal, and after that we can classify mild, moderate, severe. We can diagnose the ultrasound and also uh, fetal MRI, uh, fetal hydrocephalus. Uh, a traditional or mostly uh, the, the, these uh, cases uh, we can treat postnatal treatment shunt or ETV. But early onset uh, the hydrocephalus. Sorry. Early onset hydrocephalus cannot be rescued some um, postnatal shunting or ETV because neurodevelopment irreversible impaired in two or three weeks before fetal lung maturity. We know some, uh, we have the, some data from animal studies and human e e events. Uh, <clears throat> when the, uh, the early onset hydrocephalus first mechanical compression and stretch of periventricular tissue, after that reduced cerebral blood flow and perfusion pressure, and after ependymal denudation, very important to step this step. Uh, then reactive astrogiliar and microgiliar proliferation. Abnormal uh, after the denudation, also we can see abnormal neurogenesis and migration abnormalities, especially of uh, the progenitor and neural crest stem cell. Slow and alt altered uh, the uh, chaotic CSF flow after the denudation and accumulation of waste products in brain tissue. And then hypoxia or ischemia causes nitrative stress. Uh, if they continue uh, this uh, reversible dysfunction, uh, the calcium related proteolysis start and after axon and neurons are irreversible destroyed in white matter. So intraterrestrial and progressive brain deterioration and subcortical disconnection in two or three weeks uh, can uh, result in a re reversible situation. So theoretical in isolated fetal hydrocephalus, we should protect the brain with in utero decompression. We decided in uh, 2013 uh, that the three, uh, our research team, the three core uh, member, uh, me and Jose Luis Peiro, fetal surgeon and director uh, the Cincinnati Children's Hospital and Fetal Center, and Mark Oria, the neuroscientist. First, we started to uh, compare the, you know, uh, this um, first, the uh, cisterna magna uh, in, uh, injection, we can create the hydrocephalus. But first, we compare the injection technique. Uh, the, uh, we used to, uh, the, the, former technique uh, in the cisterna magda in the injection uh, we inject the, uh, the cowley. <clears throat> uh, we compare uh, the three methods transuterine, transabdominal and open method uh, but is transabdominal method uh, a little bit uh, this complication we see is uh, you can see in ultrasound hyperechoic particles the cowling particles in the bloodstream so um, we ignore the, this uh, the method, especially this uh, transabdominal method. Uh, we say the fail abortion and the death. So uh, we use uh, the uh, transuterine or open method in the future our studies. So after that, uh, we compare the agents. Uh, we publish Journal of Neurosurgery Pediatric. Um, the, uh, we use the same method but differences, uh, different uh, agent. Uh, we compare kaolin, a, a kind of the aluminum silicate, and the onyx, a kind of the uh, embolic agent, and bioglue, uh, the profile bovine serum albumin and glutaraldehyde. 
uh, we uh, inject uh, the in cisterna magna, uh, but before injection, we draw uh, first uh, the CSF. You can see the drop, CSF drops, because it's, uh, the, uh, the some agents the must affect. After that, we inject the, uh, the trans uh, inject the agent uh, with a transuterine or open method. Kaolin, we inject the kaolin, uh, bioglue, and the onyx. We generate the fiddle hydrocephalus in 19 uh, uh, fiddle lamps. Also, we use the five lamps for control from cotyvins. Uh, we use the fiddle ultrasonography to monitor the hydrocephalic progression. And also, uh, we developed the Cincinnati hydrocephalus severity scale for assessment of hydrocephalus in fiddle lamps. So we divided uh, the uh, according to lateral ventricle diameter and the ratio between LV and BD, uh, normal, mild, moderate, sever hydrocephalus. Uh, we observe all the agents, uh, the vent, uh, ventricular dilatation. But the silver hydrocephalus, the green uh, curve, the silver hydrocephalus induction, which uh, we observe with bioglue injection. Uh, head circumference and the biparietal diameter almost stable, uh, the, the, the size is stable. Also, brain compression was observed in hydrocephalus fetus in all injection group, but silver compression with bioglue injection. <clears throat> you can see prenatal fetal MRI injection and cotyvins in uh, the no injection fetus, uh, inject, bioglue injected the fetus, normal, postnatal first day normal and injected, and postnatal first day also the after the harvest macroscopic uh, image you can see. Uh, we uh, we perform the uh, immunostain uh, microscopy and uh, with GFAP, GFAP and the uh, IBA1 for astrogiliosis and macrogiliosis. Uh, hydrocephalus induced paravalateral ventricular all group astrogiliosis. This is the control and the bioglu, the macrogiliosis, especially astrogiliosis. We, we, we observed uh, all hydrocephalic groups, but only choline induced astrogiliosis in the brain stem, in the brain stem, and uh, also uh, macrogiliosis. But uh, bioglue not uh, created the, any uh, astrogiliosis or chemical macrogiliosis. Also, choline induced astrogiliosis in the also the cerebellum. And also onyx, uh, in the onyx group, we observe massive focal macrogiliar aggregations in some outer areas of the cerebellum. Uh, if for our the study, we conclude by a glue and onyx easily injected like the choline, uh, but our novel model, uh, the bioglue is more effective than onyx or choline. We found also bioglue works as a mass effect without local chemical neuroinflammatory reaction. So Kaolin have demonstrated a local chemical meningitis like neuroinflammatory response. So we think uh, also we use uh, the, this bioglue method for the in the future our studies, uh, especially injection time, uh, we use 85 days, especially corresponds to to 20 or 22 weeks in human. So we want to use to mimic uh, creation uh, hydrocephalus for, like human. We know uh, the 40 years ago almost, uh, the interuterine treatment such fetal ventricular amniotic shunting and repeated cephalosynthesis has been tried, but has failed to improve the prognosis of congenital obstructive hydrocephalus. Um, so, after that, especially we know 2008, 2011, the Sergio Cavallero uh, the reported and concluded uh, the 
although eratophthalic cases uh, for the field of hydrocephalus, uh, they try repeated cephalocentesis and ventricular amniotic shunting. And also for the dirt four cases, uh, they perform fetal ETV, but it couldn't, uh, they concluded uh, that the technical is very difficult. And uh, so we can see in the, this article, we can see any image. So uh, the, all of the, some authors, they give up the interuterine, but we want to continue these are the studies, fetal ETV for induced congenital hydrocephalus in sheep, in large animal model, especially uh, we want to use fetal ETV for an early ventricular decompression and potential arrest of the fetal brain damage in the fetal lamp model. So we want to evaluate effectivity and feasibility of fetal ETV on the reduction of ventricular size in fetal obstructive hydrocephalus. And we want to learn ventricular anatomical details in hydrocephalic fetal lamp. So we used the, the same method, bioglue injection method. Uh, we divided three groups, control, control, and uh, control group, and without ETV, with ETV group. Eight, uh, eight fetus uh, without ETV, 16 fetus with ETV. Uh, we injected uh, the 85 and 90 days, and uh, we uh, performed the fetal ETV after the almost the two or three weeks, three weeks, and we did the C-section and harvest this uh, gestational day. We used to do the same method. We inject the bioglue. Uh, we perform first uh, fetal ETV, the cyloscope, but cyloscope is with very bad image and small and bad image. After that, we give up this uh, the instrument and we use uh, mostly seven or eight French rigid cystoscope or fetoscope. Um, the, our entry point, we revised the coherent point, uh, the human coherent point, uh, according to uh, anatomical differences uh, the, in the fetal sheep. First, 10 or 12 catheter was inserted in the frontal horn of right lateral ventricle. And we used the ultrasound to follow up, and our method, uh, we follow up according to Cincinnati hydrocephalus severity scale the injected without ETV and no injection control, the cotivins. <clears throat> I want to show you uh, our fetal ETV video. We access uh, the right lateral ventricle roof, corpus callosum agenesis, you can see choroid plexus, right atrium. The double speed is almost we perform the video, the uh, this ETV uh, operation duration, uh, the almost three or four minutes. The, la the left lateral ventricle, because corpus callosum agenesis, very narrow for a man monroe, because uh, this also this very large interthalamic adhesion, massa interthalamica because uh, a little bit anatomical difficulties if you compare human and the fetal lamp, mammillar body and tuber scenario, the floor of the third ventricle, you can see. Uh, without energy, only uh, the uh, mechanical, we open the hole, only mechanical, no energy. We don't use the laser, not laser energy. <laughs> After that, after the open the hole, a little bit, uh, we want to observe interpedicular cistern, but very narrow if you compare the with human because this uh, anatomical the, the head the, the different uh, fetal lamp. We 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 uh, we we can uh, see the basilar artery and also ocular motor. Uh, the results, anatomical differences between fetal lamp and human skull and brain structures, especially fetal lamp brain, front to rear length, more longer 
compared to the human brain. Uh, Non-distensible and compact third ventricle uh, due to large interthalamic adhesion <coughs> and narrow for a man monroe. Uh, you can see <coughs> the cotyvins, the right fetus, the with fetal ETV, left fetus, no ETV. Fit with fetal ATV, you can see significant uh, decompression and the improvement and brain thickness if you compare the uh, no ETV injection, Biaglu, we injected Biaglu, Biaglu, but we performed the fetal ATV. Also, there's the same TVs the, without ETV, with ETV. You can see the brain very decompressive brain thickness, improvement brain thickness. And also, uh, we studied in these TVs uh, with uh, intercellular junction proteins with ancaderine and BIV tubulin. So without ATV, you can see denudation, epandemal denudation you can see. But with ATV group, uh, right fetus, uh, this is a normal epandemal lining. Also, of course, we can know, we can uh, go ahead the studies, uh, what we be, uh, do, what we did. We protect the ep epandemal denudation or prevent. Uh, we can see in the future. Uh, after that, uh, the, uh, we uh, evaluated the, the results, lateral ventricle uh, width, um, this is silver without ETV. After the we performed the fetal ETV, the curve close to mild. But if we divided uh, the the uh, injection group silver and the moderate group, uh, when we uh, performed the fetal ETV in silver groups, the curve closed to moderate. So if we uh, perform the Fetal ETV for moderate hydrocephalic group, curve close to normal, lateral ventricle width. The same results, uh, the uh, we see uh, the ratio between the, the ratio between LVD and BPD. The curve close to if the several hydrocephalus moderate, if the moderate hydrocephalus after the ETV, curve close to mild or normal. So. Uh, we, we can conclude, uh, we demonstrated the fetal ATV, technical feasible. Of course, we want to a little bit develop, we, we want to uh, the, uh, the continue the studies as technical also. But uh, some uh, ship, uh, anatomical difficulties, we can, we can uh, success this fetal ATV. We demonstrated the lateral ventricle width reduction with fetal ATV and significant decompression and improvement and brain thickness after the fetal ETV. Uh, moreover, we, we continue our translational research projects. Uh, we want to check histologic, cellular, and molecular effect of fetal ETV. We want to clarify natural history of congenital hydrocephalus, uh, including denudation and um, neural uh, pro progenitor cells migration abnormalities. And we, of course, it is very important. We want to check efficacy and possible role of fetal ATV, especially on postnatal neurological development and cognitive functions. Maybe in the future, uh, we can study in the different uh, animals. Of, uh, in the future, our main purpose to start the pilot human tr trial, but not now. Uh, we want to continue to our studies. So uh, we reviewed and reported the, uh, the 2020 uh, the, in the child's nervous system, the, in the focus decision. Uh, we, we reported to some of our results. So finally, uh, I want to thank uh, especially Jesus Uson Minimal Invasive Surgery Center, Caceres, Spain, because we did some uh, the operations here, uh, the founder and the scientific director and all of the members. And we strongly believe that the development of these collaborative research models will provide the, maybe in the future the best in utero approach for congenital hydrocephalus. I want to special thanks to Fidel Hydrocephalus Research core team 
again, Jose Luis Pero, is a surgeon, Mark Oria, basic neuroscientist, and the Fetal Center Clinic Director, Fung Tian Li. And all of the our payroll lab team. Thank you so much. Really uh, fascinating, um, um, almost amazing, uh, Sonar. Thank you. We're, we're going to do all of the questions at the uh, at the end, if you don't mind. And um, uh, we will now move to Taka, who will. Um, talk about why not do um, in, in vitro, in, in uh, prenatal uh, treatment of hydrocephalus. Um, Taka, it is all yours. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm talking a fetal hydrocephalus and if fetal surgery would improve their outcome today. The question is, will the uh, surgical intervention in utero for fetus with hydrocephalus improve their outcome? And today, I'm, I'm going to discuss with you using uh, some uh, review of the papers and my personal um, uh, series. As you may know, hydrocephalus is one of the, the most common CS, CNS disorders and we need to distinguish hydrocephalus from ventricular dilatations. A definition for isolated fetal hydrocephalus is if the part of the lateral ventricle is larger than uh, 15 millimeters. As you can see on this slide here, the part of the atrial diameter is consistent at the 7.6 millimeter from 14 to 38 weeks gestations. And if this part is at a larger than a 15 millimeter, we consider this uh, fetus has the hydrocephalus. When we discuss about the fetal surgery for hydrocephalus, we need to know that uh, from gestation 16 weeks to the uh, atom, the brain started to develop drastically. And I also needed to address the fact that we know very small part of the CSL, CSL physiology in our life. At this stage, as I mentioned, volume of the CSL should be very small. It means less chance to develop high pressure ventriculomegaly in fetus. And the problem is that uh, Pathology of fetal hydrocephalus vary from one case to the others. It is well known that the certain population of cases of fetal hydrocephalus are X-linked, which I do not discuss today since we know that the prognosis of those patients were not so good. As some of the cases are syndromic and some have chromosomal anomalies which I do not discuss in detail today uh, I, I, either. It is also well known that the craniofacial anomalies and other associated anomalies are also um, are seen in uh, human cases. I do not discuss the detail of those issues today. I will discuss with the natural history of fetal hydrocephalus and outcome by reviewing some papers today. Um, in this paper, authors collected 38 cases of fetal hydrocephalus. 15 out of six, uh, 26 were isolated ventriculomegaly. 
Seven are archaeodactyl stenosis, four are abnormal of corpus callosum, one carbon safety per CD, one porencephaly, and the two mild ventricular dilatations. The outcome is following that the five patients opted for the termination. And as you can see here, five baby showing a normal development. Now how about the uh, case with the associated anomalies? Seven cases had associated abnormally. Only one case in this series have a normal development. The conclusion of this article is that uh, fetus with isolated ventricular megaly have an 80% chance of survival and a 50% chance of normal development. Now we're going to the next paper. It is the uh, one of the meta-analysis. They studied 11 studies and uh, uh, collected fetus number is 137. Because 27 uh, pregnancy was terminated, uh, remaining 110 cases were reviewed. 15 cases are still born so that uh, remaining 95 cases were uh, reviewed. The result is that uh, 41 cases out of 95 has uh, no disability. On the other hand, 17 cases had a mild to moderate disability and 37 cases have a severe disabilities in this um, analysis. We need to assess that the which kind of the uh, basic pathology has uh, some effect. As I mentioned, we have uh, many types of the fetal hydrocephalus and uh, I will discuss the arcadectal stenosis and the dandy walker cyst first. And this is the paper of, of the uh, fetal therapy for the arcadectal stenosis. And uh, I will show you the, my own cases. And this is, uh, uh, this is the MRI of uh, fetus. As you can see, MRI showed enlarged lateral ventricle and a small fourth ventricle. This is not clear on this image, but the uh, echogram showed uh, there is a, a tiny encephalosis like structure around here. And uh, after our taking the MRI, this fetus developed a rapid enlarging ventricle and the parent chose the termination of the pregnancy. How about this case? Uh, this young lady was also diagnosed as a fetal hydrocephalus in utero, but after birth, the development was normal so that she did not refer to the neurosurgeon. At the age of 12, she was referred to us because of the headache and the blurred vision. After surgery, she has no complaint at all. And at the junior high school, she was the captain of the softball team. And her condition was quite uneventful. Move on to the dandy walk assist. As you know, sometimes we do call some of them as a dandy walk assist. So the others we might call as a dandy walker syndrome. So it's a little bit different. Now this paper showed that one type close to the normal tend to have a normal development. On the other hand, the case with the associated anomaly have a, a poor outcome. I will show you again my own cases later. This is the one of the old paper uh, telling us that uh, they could successfully treat it to the uh, utero for the Dandy Walker syndrome. The first case is diagnosed in utero and operated after birth. As you can see on the CT, the size of the ventricle was well controlled. However, he was bedridden 
and he could not breathe by himself, he need a full support for his life. This is another case. She was also diagnosed in utero as a dandy walker cyst with slight enlarging lateral ventricle. MRI taken at the age of one month showed no enlarging lateral ventricle, but enlarged the cyst in the, in the posterior fossa. We did not do any surgical intervention uh, for her, but her development is uh, normal at this point. The conclusion for those cases uh, is that uh, both isolated aqueductal stenosis and uh, Dandy Walker have good outcome. On the other hand, if they have uh, associated anomalies, they tend to have a poor outcome. How about other type of the uh, CSF accumulated conditions? I will share with you um, my personal experiences. All cases were diagnosed and sent to us by the uh, gynecologist. This is uh, the, as you can see, um, Sparazera arachnoid cyst case. She was not come to us until her mother noticed that she might have a difficulty of learning at the age of four. Her DQ at the timing of the surgery was below average. However, after we uh, operated her, her development is improved. Now she's over 20 years old and she graduated the college and she's working as a full-time worker. This is another case echogram of the fetus showing a very large ventricle. And um, this is the uh, CT after birth and also we already to the shunt in the ventricle. And the size of the head was decreased, but uh, her condition was not so good. She was bedridden with a quite large head. Uh, it's another case. This baby was sent to us after birth. As you can see, the ventricular system was enlarged. After surgery, this baby has almost normal development. It's another case, fetal echogram, and last part of the lateral ventricle of fetal, on the uh, fetal echogram. On the MRI uh, uh, took after birth, showed the hemorrhage and the enlarged ventricle, and uh, almost normal de development was uh, observed after shunt insertion. It's another case. On the echogram, uh, we are not quite sure the anatomy of the ventricular system in this case. This is uh, the MRI taken after birth. As you can see, um, it's a kind of the interhemispheric cyst like uh, appearance. And we did operate it, but uh, this uh, kid's condition was uh, very severely affected. So a conclusion from those cases, I would again say that the isolated ventricular megaly cases have a good outcome. On the other hand, as if the case has associated anomalies and or complex anomalies have a poor outcome. So, in case of isolated form hydrocephalus, the even the surgical intervention is not so early. And they, if we do operate as possible as as fast as I could after birth, the if the uh, hydrocephalus is isolated, the outcome is quite good. On the other hand. If the uh, brain cortex is quite thin or damaged ependema, the outcome might be not so good. 
on the on the other hand, if the patient has the uh, associated anomalies, the surgical intervention is not so useful even operated very early stages. It means those kids are not the candidate for the fetal surgery either. I will show you the another case. Um, this is the uh, echogram at birth. This boy was sent again from the, our colleague gynecologist. As you can see, this uh, kid has a kind of the uh, enlarged ventricle or some cyst connected to the uh, ventricle. But on the echogram, we are not sure what is the what is this kind of the cyst. So that uh, we got the CT. And uh, during the waiting period, this part of the cyst enlarged quite drastically. And his condition was not so good at that time. And this is the CT at the age of five. Um, around the age of two, his development was quite delayed. But now his delay, he was catching up uh, quite well. And now I would say his condition is mild uh, disability. So uh, making a precise diagnosis in utero is not so uh, easy in some case. And also it's very difficult for us to predict their long-term outcome in the uh, utero or even early part of the uh, um, their life. And this is the uh, another case. Uh, this kid was sent to us from the gynecologist that uh, they are saying that it's a uh, isolated ventricular megaly. So, so we are uh, planning to put the shunt or reservoir after birth. But uh, after birth, it turns out he was, uh, um, has a Potter syndrome. So he was not the candidate for the uh, uh, surgery. So at this point, the, my answer to the question is no. However, my uh, personal future pers perspective is that uh, as Dr. Duru mentioned, with the advent of the diagnosis, diagnostic tools such as ultrasonic equipment for diagnosis and the surgical tools such as uh, fine endoscopy and uh, some types of fetal hydrocephalus will be treated in utero in near future. Um, I did operate the mouse embryos around the maybe over 100 cases and I know that the fetal surgery is quite difficult so that uh, we need to be uh, quite sure in which cases we will operate the, uh, at the time of the, uh, uh, I mean, the fetal surgery, which type of the uh, um, uh, fetus uh, candidate for the fetal surgery. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Taka. Uh, yep. This has been uh, extremely uh, interesting, uh, and uh, as we knew, it would be uh, controversial. Um, if I uh, do, we have questions. Uh, uh, we'll start off with questions from from the audience. The first one is from Pat McAllister, who should know all about the development of hydrocephalus in, in utero. Um, he says, congratulations to Sonar for a fabulous study uh, with excellent presentation. He wants to know in general about the extent of the ependymal denudation before and after the ETV. Do you see intermittent regions of the ventricle zone, of the ventricular zone that are damaged? Uh, he also wonders about ETV causes any damage to the ventricle wall. Okay, that's that's both of you can weigh in on that that question. Yes, uh, I can I can talk. 
Uh, um, wonderful, the very critical point. Yes, very good, uh, the, the questions. Also, we, uh, yes, uh, we want to learn uh, this critical point uh, because ETV timing is important. What we did, uh, prevent the denudation or protect? Uh, also, uh, another problem, uh, con uh, the station is uh, we can uh, damage the lateral ventricle uh, wall. Of course, uh, we will, we will uh, the go ahead the studies, timing. Uh, for example, we created the uh, hydrocephalus. After maybe one week, or we can see the lateral ventricle, uh, the wall, how. Uh, after that, we perform the ETV after maybe one week, maybe two weeks, or uh, before. before uh, so we can, we, we, we should to check. Yes, wonderful, good question, yes. How about you, Taka? Um, in human cases, it's not so often we do see the uh, ventricular denudations. I have uh, one case has the almost ependium was gone. But uh, in those cases, the development of the you know, baby was quite um, severely uh, disabled. So that uh, in this com context, the, the it's too late for us to treat those uh, kids. It's my personal opinion. Um, I, I, have a, I would like to ask uh, Soner, um, that, that it's a beautiful, beautiful study. Um, it is it's essential that we have animal models before we start um, doing these things on, uh, on babies. Um, I would like to know what actually causes the hydrocephalus in the uh, bioglue? Uh, what, wh where is the blockage? Um, it obviously has to be um, so that uh, the, the third ventriculostomy will allow CSF to get to where it's absorbed. But where, where is the blockage? Uh, it, Kalen causes a tremendous inflammatory response. So it's very difficult to make any, any thing of it, but the bioglue, sounds like it doesn't. So what does it do to cause hydrocephalus? Yes, uh, this is correct. Uh, uh, not, uh, especially we want to uh, target, we want to uh, the aim uh, blockage in the aqueduct sylvi. But uh, depend on the dose, bioglue dose, uh, maybe you can affect the outlet of the fourth ventricle. So now we go ahead the different dose uh, because our aim, uh, like a mimic human, uh, op isolated early onset, because our target isolated early onset hydrocephalus without additional abnormalities, genetic or another. So, uh, so uh, after the, uh, the histologic specimens, uh, sometimes uh, the, the, we see, we observe the blockage of aqueduct sylvi and sometimes the fourth ventricle. So now a little bit uh, we change the dose uh, because we want to uh, very uh, isolated aqueduct stenosis. Yes. Very interesting. Our next uh, um, co uh, question comes from Dr. Muzunda. Um, I hope I pronounced it okay. Primarily, I think for Taka. Um, how do we judge the integrity of the brain substance in two similar cases which may have different outcomes? Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, cases uh, in both of your talks today. And uh, how can you know the, pro how, how can you evaluate the, um, uh, the prognosis in uh, patients uh, in utero that look, that centrally look the same? Uh, that is the point I'd like to address, that uh, from uh, MRI or echogram on, at the time of they are very young, including the uh, fetus and uh, immediately after birth, we are not quite sure, we could not, we could not, you know, uh, predict the uh, outcome correctly, so that uh, it's very difficult personally for me that uh, select the candidate fetal 
a surgery is quite difficult at this point. That's what I'd like to um, comment. Um, the, the, uh, the, this, this issue is um, um, uh, very, very important. I, I, I think it's important to discuss um, Sergio Cavallari's uh, work uh, in this, this, this area. I think he the, has the, the most um, uh, focused uh, way of dealing with things. Um, he, his, for patients who may need intervention, uh, for him, it has been primarily the placement of a, a ventricular amniotic uh, shunt, but other things too. Uh, it would be patients, the baby should be between 20 and 30 uh, weeks of gestational life. Uh, they should definitely be progressive. The first, the first scan, usually an ultrasound, should not make the, the difference. We, you would need to make sure that it's progressive and um, a full evaluation including genetic, genetic testing, amniocentesis, to make sure that there are no other conditions that it's specifically only hydrocephalus. I think that uh, it's uh, very important. And I think that uh, the work that uh, Sonar has done or the people in Cincinnati have done uh, allows us to realize that there is, there is a situation in which you can make things better. Um, I didn't understand from Sonar's work um, what the just human gestational age uh, would be uh, at the time of uh, the first the in injection and the time of the intervention. At what age was the third ventriculostomy done up as as for humans? Uh, if, if you understand what I'm saying, Sonar. Yeah. This. Uh... Sorry, this uh, for uh, the you. Your question is the about the uh, the the our uh, injection timing. Uh, this this uh, corresponds to human gestation age. Well, you see, I think you told us that it was about 20, 20, 20 weeks. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, what so what with the time that you did the third ventriculostomy? What what fetal what? Because you can deliver a baby with relative, relative safety at 32 weeks. Uh, yeah, some, yeah. yeah some of course. 30. So when is the patient, the baby gonna yeah, get the can. evaluation? Yes, we can maybe, uh, we can, or we, we, we uh, should a little bit, we should think about, uh, you know, the, the ship, uh, the gestational term, the 140 days. Uh, for the, this, uh, the, the human uh, to, uh, 280 days. So in the, uh, our target is the early, early one set, one set is a second trimester, maybe a little bit uh, before 70 or 75, maybe we can uh, do, but is a, um, of course the relative gestational time points, uh, a little bit challenge, challenge uh, station, yes. Bit, uh, so when you what what is the date that you the, the youngest date of a human that you yes. would think could you we could do a third ventriculostomy and what is the latest date we should do because you could deliver the baby early so what is the 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 the, the area from when to when would somebody be would a baby be a candidate potential candidate for a third ventriculostomy in utero um, I think it's uh, the uh, the Shizuo Oye, the uh, categorize uh, the classification is very important. Maybe this uh, according to the we can use this classification uh, also um, because uh, early uh, when the uh, this very uh, definitive the which which day we can I don't know we can say or I don't know uh, but. Uh, the late onset hydrocephalus, maybe we can, uh, fiddle lung, lung maturity is very important, fiddle lung maturity. Maybe the, for the, some hydrocephalus cases, maybe uh, the, we, we do the C-section and early postnatal treatment, but um, uh, the, 
I think the mid uh, the secondary trimester uh, the time is, but which day uh, I cannot say now. I don't know. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Professor Perel. Um, even anecdotal cases have not had bad outcomes. More than half have moderate to severe disabilities. Why not to offer a prenatal intervention to potentially improve outcomes in selected cases? I believe it's worthy to explore these options nowadays that prenatal diagnosis for technical instrumentation are more advanced. Congratulations on choosing the topic. Um, what, uh, what do you have to say to your mentor, Sonar, and what do you have to say about this, Taka? Um, as I mentioned, it's not uh, easy for us to select the cases. Um, before birth, we could not predict the outcome just on the uh, imaging. Uh, don't you think? That's the problem we have now. The... As I mentioned, um, in my series, the, uh, some have a very a good outcome, some have, have a very bad outcome, but there is a tendency that uh, the complex hydrocephalus have a worse outcome and associated cases has a worst outcome. On the other hand, isolated ventricular megaly cases tend to have a good outcome. I would say that, but uh, in a small detail was not, um, in small detail, we could not tell on the uh, image at the time of the uh, um, early stage of the uh, fetal life. That's the problem we have now. Can I ask a question? Hal, if you permit me, can I just ask a question to the speaker and, and ask your comment on the same? You know, we've, we've just raised the issue of uh, Shizu Oi's famous classification, which ran into pages, if you remember. And, and Shizu had this classification of primary hydrocephalus versus dysmorphic hydrocephalus. And uh, in spite of the fact he's visited me at least five times and we've had prolonged discussion about this, my understanding is this is, was a bit like a chicken and an egg situation. If you have a primary problem in the brain itself, and this is something Taka alluded to when he talked about hydrocephalus versus ventriculomegaly. If you have a brain whose development is uh, not normal, you could have ventricular dilatation. Whereas if you have a true congenital hydrocephalus, you would also have ventricular dilatation. It is clear that if you have uh, a sort of ex vacuo ventricular megaly because the brain hasn't developed, these infants or these fetuses cannot benefit from any form of surgical intervention as far as neurodevelopmental outcome is concerned. Whereas if you have somebody who has a true uh, hydrocephalus with ventricular megaly secondary to some obstruction in the fetal period, as some of the cases that you showed are, um, are, are the, what you've been producing in the sheep models, then that would make a difference. So how do you distinguish whether the ventricular dilatation is the primary problem or is it the brain that's the primary problem in the fetus that has caused ventricular megaly? Because unless you can make this distinction, you won't be able to choose the category of uh, fetuses that would benefit from surgical intervention. Uh, may I comment? Yeah, please. I'd like both of you to comment and then we'll ask the the authority um, for his opinion. As you may know, in case of X-linked hydrocephalus, the... Uh, Hello? Oh, may I continue? Uh, the uh, ventricular size were very big in some cases. And uh, because the size of the head is increasing, sometimes we do put a shunt for those uh, uh, X-linked hydrocephalus cases. But as you know, the ICP of those are very, very, very low. Sometimes less than three centimeter, you know, mercury. 
it means even the some case has a enlarged ventricle, it does not mean they have a true hydrocephalus. So it's not easy to tell which type has the uh, hydrocephalus, which has uh, just a uh, um, ventricular megaly caused by the uh, atrophy of the brain or maldevelopment of the brain. Sona, your opinion? Is there a way we can do yes. monitoring of intracranial pressure in fetus in utero? Yeah, it is the same. Uh, if the uh, no intracranial pressure, uh, without intracranial pressure, if you if we see uh, ventricular enlargement, uh, the, some encephalomalacic area is brain abnormalities, of course. So fetal MRI and uh, uh, also this the uh, fetal MRI, we can see some uh, the uh, the indications this like this uh, of course we, we we should follow with ultrasound or in necessary is the fetal mri and yes also this again uh, i want to say the denudation step very very important denudation step if we protect the theoretical theoretical if if we can uh, prevent or if we can prevent the denudation i think uh, is very good. We can uh, get the very good results because after the denudation, um, the CSF flow is uh, the very chaotic. We can see the uh, CSF flow and proliferation and neural progenitor cells migration abnormalities. So first, our target uh, before the denudation, or I, we don't know now what we uh, fiddly TV, what we do, we will continue uh, is very important. Denudation step very, very important because before the denudation, only mechanical compression, hypoxic, maybe reversible changes. But after the denudation, uh, the CSF uh, flow is very chaotic in the lateral ventricle there inside or interstitial area, some vast products. So then, uh, I want to say again, the denudation, uh, the step very, very important. How, your opinion, how do you distinguish which came first, the chicken or the egg? Was the ventricular megaly the primary event that caused brain atrophy or the brain atrophy the primary event that caused ventricular dilatation in utero? Yes, um, I, I would, this actually, I, I think this, this is a very, very important part. And I, 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 I would say that Sergio Cavallari and his work has shown this very well. He demands that there be two imaging at, 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 uh, with some time between. So a hydrocephalus ex vacuo, like hydranencephaly or like um, some of the other uh, conditions will, will, uh, will stay the same. It will not be progressive. And he, he does not suggest, and I think it's I think it's something we should all take in, in the, in the care that it has to be a, a, a time that it's occurring, that it's that's getting worse. Uh, you don't you don't want to keep things standard in time, but you want something. Hydrocephalus has to be dynamic. It has to be occurring, and so. Um, I, I would think that the issue about the ex vacuo um, is would be um, for the most part could be managed by two to uh, a few days or a week a week um, apart. Um, I, I think that we need to look for the genetics and maybe do an amniocentesis. The question about the ICP monitoring is 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 of no value. Because the um, the 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 the, ba the fetus is not seeing atmospheric pressure; they're seeing amniotic fluid pressure. So the pressure difference between the ventricle and the outside world is is uh, is the amniotic fluid, and that's really important in spina bifida because they they are they're together. The the amniotic fluid and CSF are 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 both uh, seen together. That's why. It's so important to do something early because there's a constantly deteriorating situation. I think to to do uh, fetal surgery for hydrocephalus, you have to show that there is something going on 
that you need to prevent from getting worse. Um, and that's easy now, I think, with what we know about Chiari 2s and, and spina bifida. It's much more difficult than it is in, in hydrocephalus because the imaging is not enough always to be able to tell uh, whether it's progressive or not. And progressive re requires the ventricles to get larger. Is that an answer to your question? Yeah, yeah. There are some more questions in the chat box, uh, Hal, you might want to. Talk. Yes. Uh, uh, the next one is uh, from Helen Williams, and um, it is a question of how we, um, the, what, where the blockages, I think. Um, we should not be surprised at the use of glue and compartmentalization of the CSF spaces can be rescued by ETV. This does not address Taka's observation about the prognostic uh, un uncertainty. And I certainly agree that it's hard to be absolutely certain about uh, the, uh, the outcomes unless you have a genetic marker or an anatomic uh, issue. Um, would you like to discuss that a bit, um, Taka? Um, yeah, um, I, I didn't discuss with the uh, genetical uh, abnormal cases and the chromosomal abnormal cases in this uh, in today and because uh, I personally think those cases are not candidate for the uh, fetal surgery but uh, we do not know all the uh, genetic um, studies yet and when I was working in the animal lab if we do modify the uh, certain part of the uh, genes or we do use a uh, knockout mice which are not directly related to the CSF physiology, but uh, many uh, knockout mice develop hydrocephalus. So that uh, there are many things we should, uh, you know, study and learn from the uh, those genetic studies. So we needed to, uh, you know, collaborate with the uh, animal researchers more. That's what I, I would uh, comment. Thank you. Um, from Adrian Kajaras, uh, is there a difference between uh, the match, maturation of the quarry plexus and the role of CSF dynamics in the, in the fetus? I think I, I, I will answer that in, in terms of the fact that the quarry plexus is not the only place where CSF is made. It is also made as a, a byproduct of, uh, of cerebral metabolism so that um, the brain itself is making, making CSF. Um, a choroid plexectomy has been shown in, in, um, in, in children and adults that, if, uh, that it'll decrease CSF production by about a half, but it doesn't, um, it, it, within a few months, it's still making the same amount that it had before. So, you don't need a choroid plexus to, to, um, to create cerebrospinal fluid. Um, the, the purpose of the choroid plexectomy and the third ventriculostomy is, um, is, is to delay the distension of the, by decreasing the CSF production, uh, it delays the, um, the, uh, the hydrocephalus long enough uh, for the skull to sol solidify so that the, um, this is a whole new, a new thing. I, I do want to point out, I think that um, I, I, there are two, two issues that I'd like to, to say about quickly. There, I don't think that uh, there are other questions at the moment. Two, first thing I, I, um, uh, I want to talk about, I think was from um, Frank Van Kallenberg, and um, he, he, he said that it's really important to have excellent and very, dis, very clear um, uh, opinions. The, there, there, are three, there are three people that are involved in this discussion um, uh, for informed consent. One is the child who's the surrogate for that would be the mother. Um, the second is the mother, because there are definitely um, uh, obstetrical 
uh, um, problems. Uh, there have been ruptured uh, uterus after, a, after an open um, repair, uh, these sorts of things. And the third is subsequent pregnancies by the mother, because is it going to uh, affect the ability of the mother to have uh, f future children? I think the, the inf informed consent in fetal surgery is, uh, is very challenging and has to be thought of very, very carefully when you go in. Now, the other thing is the, uh, the idea uh, of, of whether you should do fetal surgery or not uh, depends on a number of things. Um, and, and the way to do this is to, do, uh, to create an animal model. And I think that Soner and, and his colleagues in, in Cincinnati have done an absolutely spectacular job in studying uh, an animal model that can be useful in helping us make these decisions. And this, that's, that's stage one. Stage two would be um, a small um, number, like in the mom study. There were three, I think there were only three in the United States, there were only uh, three centers that were allowed to do the prenatal uh, until they got it right and were able to publish their data. So that, there's, that's, the, that's stage two. Um, and, and then the doubt come from that will lead to a widespread use, use of it. Uh, the, in spina bifida, it's much, much clearer. Everything is always much clearer than it is in hydrocephalus because getting the, getting the diagnosis right in hydrocephalus is much more difficult. Um, and I think that uh, this, is the, this is the issue. Um, but I think that uh, we, we shouldn't, if we can stop irreversible damage, in the fetus, we need to define at during what time the hydrocephalus uh, occurs and is diagnosed, and what time can it um, can it be treated. Uh, the um, the question in the Cavallari work has always been that 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 um, a lot of it was done. Uh, the interventions were done late, too late to help. Number one, and um, it was safer to to deliver the child early. If the, if the child was uh, 30, uh, definitely at 32 weeks, but at, even at 30 weeks, it's probably safer to um, deliver the child, child early. Um, I, I'd like your all th thoughts, thoughts about those issues. How? Yes. I have a question to the uh, sonar. Yeah. Um, as you know, the it's not, ETP do not work in some percent of the uh, young infant. Uh, how about the uh, fetus? Do you think ETP works fine in case of the uh, a human? It's a kind of the practical question to you. So is uh, you see it is uh, your question is the ETV is the works in the fetus? Yeah, in uh, human. Uh, uh, we will see. Of course, we continue. But is uh, you know the, in the fetus uh, absorbs absorption area the pachyonia granulase is the after the postnatal mm -hmm. postnatal. But interuterine period, you know, some absorption area is lymphatic lymphatic uh, the vessels and the, like this. So we, we show, we demonstrated uh, lateral ventricle weight reduction uh, after the ETV. But of course, uh, a little bit, uh, we want to go ahead. Uh, I think because it's, uh, uh, we cannot patch uh, in the inter 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 interuterine period. If not any hydrocephalus, normal fetus, but no problem. But it was uh, another uh, absorption area. Uh, we will see. We will see. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank okay. you. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. Okay. From um, Dr. Elbana. Um, now that we can do open fetal surgery, why not shunt them at the same time? Uh, the, the remainder of that question is we are dealing with a progressive pathology and with parents who refuse to abort after full investigation and genetic labs 
and proper scans, we know anyway, the infant will go for shunting. So why do we postpone at least the pressure effect by draining uh, of shunts and choosing ETV, we have to see the effect of the stenosis. I, I, would, I would say I'm not sure I completely understand. The, the problem of whether a, a third ventriculostomy works depends on the, the, where, the, where the failure of the CSF flow is. Uh, sometimes you can tell that um, on the imaging. Uh, sometimes you can't. I don't think I could have uh, been sure on the, um, uh, on the animal model that uh, the Cincinnati group has developed, but it certainly shows that it, it works in that context. So um, you certainly didn't, don't want to do a third ventriculostomy in something where there's no chance that it'll work. Um, but I think that they, that they proved that the hydrocephalus was ameliorated, that the ventricles got smaller, the brain got larger. So I, I do think that they made their, made their point quite well. Would it not be technically, we talked about the fact that it's technically challenging to do an endoscopic third ventriculostomy in a fetus, and I think there's no disagreement about that. What about doing something like a ventricular subgalial shunt in the, in the, in the fetus? But that's technically much easier to do. And uh, would, that, would that help tide over uh, the period? What do you think? Yeah. They can try the, the, the ventricular subcalial shunt, huh? you will say. You guess, yeah. Uh, you know, some group uh, the, from the Pittsburgh, I think, there's a ventricular amniotic shunt. They, they try to devolve some of uh, the models. Some also, uh, they uh, get the, the bioglue uh, hydrocephalic model, the Pittsburgh group. Of course, the challenge that, uh, that what we do, uh, the, the, the ventricular amniotic shunt, uh, ventricular subcalial shunt, some technical problems, or ETV. Uh, uh, it's, it's possible, it's, <laughs> we can maybe this, but uh, our aim now, the ETV, we, we will see. We will see, of course, of course, this, yeah, a challenging situation. Hal, what do you think? Do you think it's, a, it's an option to do a ventricular subgalial in a fetus? It's a technically very easy operation to do. I'm not sh sure that it is uh, that easy when when you're uh, when you've opened the, the scalp to the amniotic fluid. Um, I, I think your uh, uh, the, the pressure differentials would be would be very interesting in that situation. The percutane the the um, and I don't know whether it's available or not. But if you've seen the the shunt system that Cav Cavallari uh, uses with uh, two uh, spiral things. He puts it in it straight and then you take the, take the thing out and it creates the inability for the, for the, for the catheter to move. And so um, the difference in, in, in if the, the, the pressure differential uh, then would be between the ventricle and the, and the amniotic fluid. I don't think it would be very different between the ventricle and the, and the, um, and the subgalials subgalial space. Um, I think that the third ventriculostomy, if it can be done, and I think that they're proving quite well that it is, it is possible, uh, a lot more work needs to be done, but I'm extremely excited about, about the ability to do a third ventriculostomy in a, in a, in a fetus. Um, Cavallari tried three of them and uh, was unable to do it uh, and sort of abandoned it very uh, quite, I think, I think we have to learn uh, about, about techniques. Um, I also, you know, it, the, the, ability, the ability of moving the, um, uh, Sonar, do you, do, you do you suture or something, the uh, hole that you made uh, in the scalp to get the third, to do the third ventriculostomy? I'm, I'm very worried about the mixing of, of amniotic fluid and, and CSF. Yes, uh, the, the, the suture, sometimes suture and glue. Oh, glue, okay. Glue, yeah. Only one stir and glue. Yeah, is uh, some some uh, uh, operations uh, with transuterine without open. Uh, some uh, operations the after the uterine wall the open, we perform the fetal ETV. We will see which technique is good. Of course, 
the instrument is very important. Maybe in the future, uh, we develop the new instruments because we use we used uh, fetoscope and stethoscope, but a little bit long. Okay, thin, but long. Maybe maybe the short and the thin, and also maybe uh, the image is very important. Celloscope is good, but a very bad image. Of course, uh, we wish we make uh, the develop to some instruments, some technical details is very important. Of course, theoretical, we, we can help the, for isolated hydrocephalus or no. Uh, of course, the, we, we go ahead. We go ahead. The nuts now. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Well, I think that um, is, uh, we know by, by the wonderful mom study, which uh, is sort of um, related to fetal surgery has proven the value of, of, of fetal surgery and the value of a team that can handle those kinds of issues. I think that that's, that's, that's the first um, plateau. Um, and I think that uh, what you're doing now uh, will answer, will may answer the question. And I agree with Taka that this is not something to just do. Uh, it's something that we need to have data on and we need to, to know what, what we're doing. For, for now, I think the options are do the same kinds of uh, studies that you do for you if you were gonna do a, fe a fetal surgery and then commit to early delivery as soon as, as, soon as is um, uh, reasonable. Um, and 30 to 32 weeks would be, would be that. But I think that, that there will come a time when uh, we will know, and I'm, I, I think based on the information that you have given us about your experiences with the LAM model, I think that that day will come. I'm very excited about it. Um, the, uh, the quest, there was a question about the pressure setting. Uh, if you were gonna do a, um, a shunt in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the fetus, I think the answer to that is that most of the shunts that have been done, and very few of them have actually had, had pressure valves uh, in them. They've been one-way valves uh, just to prevent uh, uh, the, the, the CSF, the, uh, the amniotic fluid from getting in the CSF. So the issue would be it has to be lower, the pressure in the, in the ventricle has to be lower than the amniotic fluid because the skull is so distensible, the head circumference is so distensible. But one of the things that happens is it looks like that in your model, the, uh, the, the skull does not get bigger when the ventricles get, get larger. So the, um, it's, the, the, it's, it's not causing the, the skull to get bigger in your lambs. It does in babies though, because we know they can get very, very large heads. I, um, uh, is there anybody else that has a, a, a question? I've, been, I, I've learned a lot today. No, I think that's all uh, held. I think um, we're um, coming to the end of 90 minutes of a really amazing uh, discussion. And it only remains um, for me to thank the speakers. But before that, I'm going to ask each one of you a question whose answer has to be yes or no. Do you think in 2030 at the ISPN, we will have people presenting their series of in utero surgery for hydrocephalus? Taka, yes or no? Uh, I would try. <laughs> okay. Sonner obviously thinks that's going to happen. Reality by 2030, we're going to have people doing uh, in uterus surgery for hydrocephalus. Yes. I will try. Yes. <laughs> and how? <My> <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. Of course. Oh, we all have to. We all, we all have to learn. We all have to. Um, you know, um, we have to. We have to grow. I, I, I'm certain that there will be. Um, uh, I think maybe we have a Star Wars thing where you can put your fingers up and, and say, you know, uh, we'll all be okay with a, with, um, uh, a subcutaneous something or, or other. But I do think that this, this will evolve. Um, and it, it, there, um, I think it's, uh, it's exciting. It's very exciting. Uh, and I think you've gotten, gotten a, little, a long place. Okay. So that, the, the the, uh, the topic of uh, Professor Rickett's next paper, 
in utero surgery for hydrocephalus and a proposal to stimulate debate again. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I need something else to keep my kids. I had you a very great time today. Thank you. Thank you, Hal, for very kindly moderating the session. Thank you, Sonar, and thank you, Taka, for being wonderful speakers. And really, I, I, it's been an amazing evening of learning, at least as far as I'm concerned. I so agree. on behalf of the Educational Committee of the ISBN, thank you all for participating today. And I would like uh, Linda to share her screen with you so that you know that the next Clash of the Titans, which is the pre-Christmas Clash of the Titans slated for the 18th of December, is on a spinal topic in children with scoliosis and asymptomatic tethering. Deformity correction may be done without untethering as a primary procedure. And we look forward to all three of you being there with us on that day, Hal, as well. And as Doug Brockmeyer and uh, David uh, clash swords, it's a, it's a United States debate, uh, but we would like the whole world of pediatric neurosurgery to be watching. Good morning, good afternoon, or evening, wherever you are in the world. See you in a fortnight. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.